like many of you, like the Apostle Paul, I've known what it's been like to both be well-fed and hungry, to have much and to have little, to feel euphoric and to feel sad. You see, our lives are full of ups and downs and hills and valleys, abundance and needs. I have lived the daughter as the daughter of a successful business entrepreneur, including trips to Europe and South Africa and more. And I have been a single mom standing in the government commodities line waiting for cheese and butter. Now, most of us have been taught that to believe that happiness is linked to our accomplishments and the stuff that we have. We think, I'll be happy once I get married, or I'll be more satisfied at work when I get a promotion. That we will finally find joy when we can run that marathon or buy that luxury car or get into the right college. The truth is that we can create a feeling of happiness right now regardless of our circumstances. How do we cultivate contentment each and every day of our lives? Well, try Googling that question because there are tons of blogs and podcasts and books and a whole lot more, but they all say pretty much the same thing. So these particular order and words come from Dr. Julie Rosenberg. Number one. Pause. When you find yourself unhappy with someone or something, pause. Take a deep breath and remind yourself to accept that person as they are and embrace their good qualities. Or just try to look at the bright side of any situation. Number two, stop buying stuff you don't need. Now, that came home particularly during the flea market, especially during the bag sale, right? <laughs> but when you feel the urge to buy something or think about something, think about whether it's a need or a want. And if the item is a want, think about why you're not content about what you have right now. And ask yourself, do I need this now? And wait a few days, see if the urge to buy it dissipates. I had a funny experience this past week. Do any of you like go shopping on Amazon and then leave things in your cart? Because you think, oh, I might come back and I might need something else later. So I went back to sort of actually order the things that I had gotten. There was something in my cart that I have no clue why I ordered it or thought about ordering it. It was really cool. I actually remember putting it in there, but I don't remember why. So giving it a few days um, often can turn what we think is a need in the moment into just a want that we don't really want. Number three, show people that you appreciate them. Be fully present. Don't be thinking about what you have to do next when someone is talking to you face to face. They are your most important priority for that moment. Offer kind words and actions to help build up your emotional bank account. Because the more you put out in the world for others, the more you will receive in return. Number four, practice gratitude. So each day, identify one person, a pet, or something that enriches your life. If you're a journaler, put it in your journal. If not, just maybe have little index cards where each day you pick one thing, write your thoughts on that card. That way, when you find yourself sort of sinking into that unhappy state, you can take a moment to review what you've written and think about all the good things that are in your life already. Number five, learn to enjoy simple things that don't cost money like hanging out with your friends at the flea market all week, meaningful conversations, walking in nature, reading a good book, 
a trip to the beach. I mean, those are things that are all free or relatively inexpensive, and they can offer more joy than all the expensive endeavors that are out there. And finally, live in the moment. Don't postpone happiness by waiting for a day when your life is less busy or less stressful. For the first year out of seminary, almost every seminary student becoming a pastor that I have ever talked to thought, when I just graduate, life will be easier. And you talk to them a couple months later, when Advent is over, it will be easier. A few months later, oh, I just need to get through Lent and Easter, and you discover life will never get easier, so you might as well be happy in the day that you're in. Because friends, the day without all those may never come. Instead, look for the opportunities to savor those small pleasures of daily life and focus on the positives of today rather than dwelling on the past or worrying about the future. Happiness that is gained through success or materialism is only temporary. Socrates once said, contentment is natural wealth. Luxury is artificial poverty. I loved that. Contentment is natural wealth. Luxury is artificial poverty. And remind yourself that grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And virtually every person who you think has everything likely doesn't feel the same way themselves. Even people who seem to have it all often don't find contentment. Why? Because a lot of times people are just driven to want more and more, and they're unhappy with themselves and their lives. Now, I do want to clarify that contentment does not preclude ambition. It doesn't mean that you will not want more. Contentment is simply gratitude, appreciation, and acceptance for the way things are right now. Anticipating that things may or may not get better in the future. Being willing to keep having visions, keep moving forward, but being okay with where you are in the moment. Now, some people might push back saying, well, what's the difference between contentment and complacency? Well, the difference can seem minor, but there's actually a world of difference. Because contentment is to be happy with what you have to find, and finding satisfaction in your present circumstances. Complacency is being unsatisfied with how your life is in the moment, and, but being unwilling to make changes to improve your situation. So it becomes pretty clear from this definition that contentment, is a choice, though not perhaps as easy as it sounds. Learning to be content comes from a combination of intentional mindset shifts, habit changes, and being aware of our thoughts and our actions. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he talked about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. They're not anxious. They just live and fulfill the purpose of their creation. And this theme of not worrying, um, it's a common one. It's picked up by many songwriters um, in our day, both past, present, and I'm sure in the future. Um, and so our question is, do they capture the spirit that Jesus and Paul are talking about? So we're going to take a look at a couple of them. The first is Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy. So here are the words. Ain't got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry. Be happy. The landlord says your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no cash. Ain't got no style. Ain't got no gal to make you smile. Don't worry. Be happy. Now, you've got to admire Mr. McFerrin's spirit, but if I'm homeless, about to be sued, have no cash, no style, and no one to love, 
I think I'd be wrong not to be concerned. <laughs> Those are crises worthy of worry. Then there's that immensely popular song from The Lion King, based upon the Swahili word meaning, no worries. Hakuna Matata, what a wonderful phrase. Hakuna Matata, ain't no passing craze. It means no worries for the rest of your days. It's our problem-free philosophy. Hakuna Matata. You all knew that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, who am I to argue against Disney magic but to believe that you're going to have no problems for the rest of your days would be a stretch for even the most rosy of optimists. So neither of those really capture the essence of what Jesus and Paul are trying to say, do they? The faith that Paul spoke of, that Jesus spoke of, is not a denial of life's pain. It's the strength to persevere through it. And God, God provides that strength. And in that strength, I would say that we will find that we have, in the most desperate of situations, amazing coping powers. Paul said it so well. One translation said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I can be content in whatever state I find myself. Paul was God sufficient. Paul could face anything. He could have everything or he could have nothing. It made no difference because in any situation, he had Jesus Christ. And the person who walks with Christ and lives in Christ can cope with anything. We also find incredible support in Christian fellowship. And Paul himself recalls and is grateful for the support of the Christian community. You shared with me in my distress, he said in verse 14. You sent aid once and again to my necessities. Now, in his case, at this particular moment, it was financial and material um, support to be sure, but it was far more than that because all of Paul's writings um, support the idea that Christian fellowship is bound together in mutual support. Because we belong to Christ, we belong to each other, and caring is the glue that holds all of us together. Many of you will know the name Lefty Gomez. Lefty is one of baseball's all-time great pitchers. And when this was affirmed by his induction into the Hall of, Baseball Hall of Fame, someone asked him the secret. He responded happily, clean living and a fast infield. <laughs> now, the first might be questioned, but not the second because we are all where we are and what we are because of other people. So we have amazing coping powers. There's support in Christian fellowship. And then there's this truth written in verse 13 of our scripture lesson. It's sort of the Mount Everest affirmation of Paul's life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have amazing coping powers. That is so true. All you have to do is look around at the people sitting here to know how true that is. And the support of the Christian fellowship is absolutely essential. That's obvious. But ultimately, ultimately we are cast back on the bedrock of the Christian faith. Our reliance on the freedom that comes from fully following Christ Jesus. And it is so rare in this life to meet a truly free person, a person who can say in all honesty, whether I live or die, whether I succeed or fail, whether I am in riches or want, I am content. And it's rare to find that peace that passes all understanding. But I think that it truly belongs to those who are truly confident in the power and the worth 
of that to which they have given their lives, to Christ Jesus, to the faith. Even though we don't always understand it, somehow it undergirds us in those times where we can just make no sense of what is going on around us, despite the validation or lack of it given by the world. Paul was telling the folk at Philippi, and he tells every single one of us now, if you need the praise, the validation, the adulation of the world, or happiness, or riches, and continual joy in life to make your life okay, then you are going to be miserable. What you need is some way to be content whether or not you abound or are abased. You have plenty or nothing, abundance or want, so that you are sure that you can say, wherever you find yourself, I have everything I need in Christ Jesus. Now, this next story is probably anecdotal, but the reporters finally tracked her down at her laboratory early in the morning to tell her that the call had just come from Stockholm. She had been awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Well, I'm surprised and flattered, she said. What will you do with the money? Someone asked. Are you glad that you're at last getting the recognition you deserve? Said another. Does it make it more special? that you are a woman, asked yet another. Oh, I don't know. Actually, I've got to get back to work. Thank you all for coming. Goodbye. And she turned and went back to her laboratory. Living in the moment, having a sense of who you are and the vision that God has placed in your life, simplifying and living a life of contentment. It's more than enough. It was for Marie Curie, and it is for us as well. Amen.